Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking today about, um, you guessed it, maps, and definitely not array maps, um, which are obviously way more exciting, but this I'll just have to do for today. Um, all right, so just a couple goals for this session. Um, very important about me section. Um, brief history of maps, um, some of the current technologies around mapping. I'm going to be learning about the libraries and things that exist. Uh, and then getting in a little more Ember specific. So what tools and add-ons are out there now for mapping Ember, best practices, patterns, and testing. Um, and then I will end with one very important thought. So um, anyway, so who am I? Um, this is my favorite emoji. Um, he's always thinking. Um, my name is Matt Gardner. Um, I'm a software engineer for the city planning department in New York City. Um, I have a formal training in city planning, um, but I pivoted over into programming uh, because I had a lot more fun doing it. Um, it's a little more lucrative also, but um, <laughs> so uh, just, you know, a map-based uh, storybook of, of who I am. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, so, you know, I, we, I could say I'm Midwestern like people in Chicago, but people in Oklahoma want to be Southern. It's a whole thing. So anyways, um, then I moved to Boston, Massachusetts. I lived there for five years where I studied urban planning. Uh, I discovered that I really love making maps. Maps are a really powerful rhetorical tool. People just identify with maps uh, because you can look at them and point to a place on a map. Say, I went there, I lived there, I grew up there. It also kind of rhetorically suggests that whatever you're showing on the map exists in reality. So uh, a lot of power there. Um, finally, moved to New York City, um, still mapping. Um, and the end, thank you. Uh, whew, that's over with, no, I'm kidding. OK, so a little bit about New York City planning. Um, yes, our motto is literally to plan for the future of New York City. Um, so it's a very inspiring motto. Um, this really just means that we are regulating the processes around how space is used in the city. And we make sure that it adheres to uh, a vision that the community shares. Um, so uh, two years ago, I joined NYC Planning Labs. Um, it's a new software development team in city planning. Uh, we work on modernization in technology and process. Um, so that's been quite an adventure. Um, we're trying to, we're changing expectations about how government delivers digital services. Um, so being a little confident on this, um, all right. So what does that mean? Um, agile, traditionally government <laughs> is very, uh, oh, I'm sorry, agile, it's Italian. Uh, traditionally government takes a waterfall approach and that means that, you know, we get your requirements, uh, six months later, uh, we give you something that you hate. Um, so we, we are kind of doing something a little more agile, as you can see. Um, we're bracing it. Uh, this more iterative approach, we host weekly demos. We, we're much more collaborative with our customers who are, sorry, who are internal partners, uh, other agencies and other uh, departments within our agency. Um, so open source, also another big unusual thing, I suppose, for government, because typically in government, um, there's, there's a level of distress of open source um, because security, period, uh, which is, is kind of not really a great um, issue. I guess it's not really a great way to, you know, kind of think about open source, but we're changing the conversation. We're changing attitudes about it. Uh, you don't have to go out and spend $7 million on a Microsoft system that doesn't work. It's, no, it's another story. Never mind. Anyways. Um, okay. So planning labs on NYC, but this presentation is not about planning labs on NYC. Although if you want to, you can try the QR code. Um, it's fine. Um, <laughs> all right. So again, we use maps every day. Um, there's a reason for that. Everything um, that happens a place in the city we rezoning affects the infrastructure around it. So everything's about sort of the proximity of sort of what change is happening. There's a new building going up that's going to affect traffic, that's going to affect shadows, that's going to make 
um, really up people upset because their condos don't have that beautiful view anymore. It's very upsetting. Um, so our flagship application, Zola, uh, which is not the wedding registry. Yes, there is a wedding registry named Zola. And yes, that joke gets used every single time I talk about Zola, so I might as well get that out of the way. Um, <laughs> It's used by 1,000 New Yorkers every day, um, made up of city planners, advocates, lawyers, um, realtors, developers, um, you know, folks who want to learn more about their, their neighborhood. So you can do things like, where can we build housing? Um, you can filter down into the different types of zoning uh, and really understand um, sort of, you know, where, where is a place zoned for housing? Um, is my property in a flood zone? Um, that's something good to know. You may have heard about sea level rate, rise, rise, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> helps convey information about what happened to my home in the future. Uh, and look up property information. So I'm going to look up the Empire State Building uh, and learn a bunch of new information about it, empower citizens to look up sort of who owns what in, in their city. Um, and all right, so um, I love these QR codes. I honestly just learned how to use them last year. I'm dead serious. I, just, I thought you had to have an app. It's a whole thing. Um, OK, so if you want to, you can go visit it instead of checking Slack. No, I'm kidding. Um, you can check Slack. Do what you want. Um, OK, so a brief history of maps. Uh, there, the rich history behind mapping. Um, so it all begins with John Snow. Um, not, not that, sorry, not that John Snow. Um, John Snow, all right. 18th century English physician, leader in the development of anesthesia, um, father of public health. He did all this great stuff. Also a vegetarian. Um, whole biography, um, it's riveting. Um, anyways. So uh, what, what we're looking at here, uh, what John Snow did was he mapped cholera deaths in Soho, London. There was a, an outbreak of cholera. Um, what you're seeing in the dots here are the deaths from cholera in Soho, and the, X are the, the X's are the uh, water pumps. And so John Snow suspected that the local water company was taking water from sewage-polluted sections of the Thames and delivering it to um, homes. So. Um, this was actually very controversial for Jon Snow at the time. He um, was not believed, and so he used maps to um, illustrate his point. Um, so this is sort of a, a uh, that's sort of an example of using map, maps beyond sort of navigating places and using them to understand sort of social issues and, and sort of the spatial relationships between things. Um, so what about mapping sociopolitical issues? Well, let's go to uh, oh, sorry, I forgot that was, all right. <laughs> Florence Kelly, let's go back to Chicago. Um, late 19th to early 20th century social and political reformer um, campaigned for children's and workers' rights in Chicago. Um, she was commissioned to map uh, urban slums. So um, she was commissioned to, to map demographic information in um, impoverished neighborhoods. And so what, what you're seeing here um, on the bottom there is um, families who earn less than $5 a week, and the blue is families who earn from 5 to $10 um, a week. Of course, this was, you know, a long time ago, so it's a little different, but still, that's not, that's Jesus. Um, so anyways, um, what this is, this is, a, this is huge. This is, this is technically brilliant for, for its time, and it, it shows, it illustrates how sort of you can use maps to, to map uh, Social, social and political phenomena, and this is basically how city planners use maps today. We always, these are called core plus maps, and um, I just think that's, that's really awesome that um, Florence Kelly was behind that. Um, so it's not just Jon Snow's show. Um, and there's another Game of Thrones. <laughs> I actually didn't finish the last season. I just, anyways. Um, all right, so uh, there's a great link in this QR code again. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so mapping tech from print to the web. Um, so let's jump back, let's jump forward a few decades in mapping technology. Um, we're no longer drawing maps on paper. Um, we are using computers.
day. Um, so recently we've seen this transition. Um, what is a web map composed of? Let's get some terms out of the way. Um, so the map you're looking at um, is just a, you know, map of Chicago. If anyone is able to recognize it, no. Um, I had to look at it this morning. Um, things like roads, bridges, landmarks, etc. This, what you're seeing there is a base map. It's static data that's always present and helps sort of contextualize, you know, what you're trying to say. Um, and then there are data layers. So things, these things can be polygons, it can be lines, it can be points. Um, they're usually, oops, they're usually it's just uh, maybe the main focus of your map. Um, so for example, back to our, back to Zola, um, the water and sort of the outlines of, of bridges you see going across the Hudson, um, these are the base maps, and then the data layers are the things that I'm turning off and on. Um, all right. So recent technologies. Um, the basic task of getting a map on screen to show information has gone through some more transformations. Um, digital maps and ArcGIS, if you ever took a GIS class. Uh, ArcGIS was big in that it sort of was the first big commercial software package for doing GIS on the computer. The problem, of course, was that it's hard to share. Um, it's not super accessible. It's still, it was still pretty, you had to you know, be an expert in, in GIS to do it, and you couldn't put it on the web. Um, 1996, MapQuest launches, launched its web service. Um, so this is a big deal because you can get directions. Um, in fact, I still hear MapQuest used as a verb. Um, so still there. Uh, the problem was it was slow. Uh, so it required a full page refresh every time you panned or zoomed or did any of that stuff. Um, so now today we have this new technology called the tile. Um, what do tiles do? Uh, they load way faster. You can pan, you can zoom. It's a better user experience. It's a better way of delivering uh, mapping information. Um, so with that said, you know, colloquially, colloquially these are called uh, slippy maps. Um, so we have them in the form of Google Maps, have them in the form of OpenStreetMap, have them in the form of Ember. No. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyways, like I was saying, um, tiles, they're just images. Um, this is kind of cool. So you can actually go to a slippy map. Maybe not Google Maps right now, because well, we'll get there. But um, a lot of slippy maps, if you just inspect them, you can see that these are just image tags. Um, okay, yeah, all right. You can you can make it a verb cast too. I mean, I, I like that one. Anyways, um, however, there are some limitations. Um, uh, it's hard to make image-based tiles interactive. So things like um, when your mouse hovers over a polygon and you want it to hover the border or something, because that's a good user experience that tells the user that they're hovering a data layer that's interactive, you could do something with it. Can't really do that with image-based um, image tiles. So why not serve them as vectors? Uh, so the browser receives the vector in the middle there in this, in this little diagram as binary information. So you have all of the data behind the maps, including the geographic data, um, and you can do a lot of great stuff with it. Um, you can do dynamic interactions, and you know if you want to filter things on the fly or change the styling on the fly, um, and all the data is included. So you can make really beautiful uh, dynamic mapping interactions, and, you're, and suddenly you're not crouching your users' browsers because they're downloading like six gigabytes of geographic data, which is which is nice. So. Okay, how are tiles made? Just a brief, just a brief discussion of how this works. Um, what you're looking at is a cylindrical map projection. Um, basically, you take the globe, roll a piece of paper around it, roll it around, and all right. So that's okay. It's a little more complicated than that, but um, there are lots of different projections, um, lots of different ways of thinking about how to project um, a, a sphere, a spherical-ish shape onto a flat surface. Um, so in web mapping, just assume that the world is, uh, is a square, um, right? I know it may feel that way sometimes, but you know, it really isn't. Um, okay, so zoom levels. Um, one tile for the world, uh, and then when you start zooming in, um, you get four tiles. Uh, each zoom level doubles the width and height of the tile um, until you go on and on and on to zoom 16. Um, 
Here's another diagram. I mean, I realize this is like the same thing, but um, I kind of like this one a little more. Um, anyways, another common format, um, not just tiles, but GeoJSON. Um, so what's GeoJSON? Uh, it's basically, I think, JSON API for storing geographic data. Um, it's just a really opinion JSON format. Um, this, sorry, this is great for, honestly, most situations. Um, you know, unless it's like you're a city planning department and you want to have like 25 layers available and you want them to be able to like stylize and vision. So no, we don't use GeoJSON for that. But most of the common cases for putting points and lines and things on the map, you can get away with GeoJSON, it's fine. All right, so putting it, whoa, putting it all together. Okay, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, you know, you have to, you, you store your data in the PostGIS database, the Postgres database. Um, it, you have a service that generates either vector tiles, um, there's another service that will style things, uh, and then you have in your browser, in this sort of uh, circular dash line, you have your browser which is rendering all this data, rendering all this information. Um, there's a lot going on here. But there's, of course, a nice cloud service called Cardo. Um, Cardo is fully open source. Um, you can run it on your own infrastructure, uh, something that we have done for, I think, uh, about a year and a half. So um, it's, it's, it's been a really great service. What does it do? It takes care of all this stuff. for you. Um, so you don't have to fully think about it, um, although if you are just like really interested in it, um, I don't know. Anyways, um, so Cardo does that for you. Um, but I would not use Cardo just to show a pin on a map for your business or something. So it might be a little overkill there. But um, all right, so accessibility. Um, the big question, uh, I mean, this is all really great te technology, but how do we make it accessible? Uh, because maps are inherently visual tools. So um, one library is called Leaflet.js. Um, you should check out Ember Leaflet, which is the Ember uh, bindings add-on for it. Um, the way it works is it's all SVG based. And so the things on the map are actually um, nodes in the DOM. And so they're actually, they're actually, excuse me, they're actually visible to assistive technology. Um, and that means you're able to control ARIA for these nodes, um, as opposed to uh, Mapbox GL, which is the example we've all been looking at. Um, Mapbox GL is canvas based. So it's a bit of a black box. Um, but if you have vector tiles, you have all the data in memory, you can do some more stuff with it, but we're just, we're honestly not quite there. One thing um, that I have used before is Mapbox GL accessibility, um, which will actually um, expose certain points of interest on maps to um, screen readers. Um, so there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, it's really a shame that there's not a lot of better sort of out of the box tooling for this sort of thing, um, but I think we're getting there. Um, Okay, briefly a case study of Zola. Um, so, basic features, as, as, as I've said, there are many, many data layers. Map state is preserved in the URL. So, you know, I wanna have five layers turned on here and everything else turned off. Um, all of it has to be captured in the URL so that people can share it. Um, lots of query params. Um, layer styles shared across other apps. So, the things like the, the colors, of the different sort of zoning types or, you know, the, the, the flood plains and how they're, you know, styled as blue because that's what flooding is. Um, we want that to be shared, you know, across all of these different applications so that we can build other, sort of uh, bring in these layers into other applications. Um, and of course, monthly data updates. Um, we wanna have this full pipeline. Of, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a, a, a few of the things, but the easiest way to jump right into WebGL mapping is with Ember Mapbox GL. Um, that is what's taking care of um, the red outline there. Um, it's a very simple um, bindings add-on for Mapbox GL. Um, it makes making maps a lot more declarative. If you've ever used Ember Leaflet, a similar idea. Um, so every, the entire Mapbox GL API space is mapped, sorry, it's uh, linked to, I was trying to avoid using that word again, mapped, um, it's linked to a specific component or helper in, in the, in the add-on. So um, it's, it makes it really easy to test and uh, makes it easier for maintainers in the future. Um, all right, so in Zola, you see these two components. Um, we're able to render the map, but how do we control it 
there's sort of these sibling components. So on your left, there's a data layers menu. On your right, there's, of course, the map. Um, um, so how do, you, how do we share the state across the sibling components? Um, in this case, we pass down these layer configuration objects into both of them. They both contain state. And so whenever, um, excuse me, so it keeps the UI synced between you know, these different components. Um, and that makes things easier to maintain um, and control. All right, um, anatomy of the map component. Um, Lots of widgets, um, lots of little doodads and things uh, that you can do, like printing. <sighs> Everyone always wants to print. Um, <laughs> so our first draft of, of this map component, um, it's very, 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 very long. It keeps going and going. Anyways, um, so our first iterations led to a super massive uh, component file um, that was hard to test and maintain. Uh, it, but it put us in a good position to refactor. So um, instead of reaching for the wrong abstraction too soon, we just sort of tacked everything onto this one component. <laughs> um, and honestly, that put us in a really good spot to begin the refactoring process. So sort of finding the seams in um, our component and splitting, grouping things together. So the highlighted lot feature, sorry, yeah, the feature for being able to highlight, you know, a tax lot, which is the term in city planning for like a piece of property. So, you know, all the code, it's, it's right there. We just group it together. Um, things like uh, drawing mode, I want to be able to measure um, this, this space or I want to create, um, find the sort of area of this space by clicking and, and drawing things. All of this is, is grouped together. Um, and again, a selected lot. Whenever I click a lot and I'm looking at its information, um, all of the code for that, it's, it's all grouped together. We just group it together and then we put it in another component. So I always think like, you know, when in doubt, make a new component. Just reach for the new class. Um, that, has, that, that seems to be working pretty, pretty good for us. Um, so in you know, line one here, we have our uh, Mapbox component. Um, which yields in this contextual parameter the map instance, and we can pass that map instance down into these other components. Um, and then these other components can, you know, they, they just can be responsible for doing whatever they need to to the map. Um, so the layer widget, for example, um, concerned with presenting things on the map, um, measurement widget and search widget and so on. Um, contextual components, very handy. Um, so the lesson here for me is you know, don't abstract too soon. Um, it's okay to have it wrong. Um, and yes, it's okay to have it wrong for a little while. Um, and refactoring and refining is just part of this sort of research process. Um, so, you know, I, the component was getting big and gross and, you know, just lots of stuff going on, but it's probably a little better than trying to predict the future too soon and trying to Say okay, I think the app's going to be this. No, let's just keep it simple. Let's just keep it simple until it gets you know a little too unwieldy, and then start grouping things together. Um, all right, tests. Um, so, uh, how do you acceptance test a WebGL canvas? You kind of don't. Um, <laughs> and I've tried. <laughs> I don't want the New York taxpayers to know how long I spent on that though. Um, <laughs> um, so it's hard to simulate things like uh, clicks and hovers. Um, HTML elements are easy to do that. You can, you know, you can click the little um, layer menu um, pieces on the left, um, but to actually simulate a hover of a mouse there, um, you have to basically tell the mouse what the XY coordinates sort of intersection is, and you have to do all this stuff. Some people have done it for um, Mapbox GL itself. So I sort of realized, well, we don't need to be testing MapboxGL because we just assume that it works. Um, okay, so that's hard to do, but there's an approach. Um, for me, it is use an elaborate stub. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, stubs provide uh, canned answers to calls made during the test. Um, so how do we stub the map? Um, dependency injection. Now, if you're application is untested, you're kind of in a catch-22, so you kind of have to, but you've been flying blind anyway, so it's okay. Um, <clears throat> so
So what you're seeing here, this, this component on the top, this is a simple wrapper component. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a simple wrapper component. Um, sorry, my throat. Um, in its template, it just yields the instance of, of the actual sort of Mapbox map. So um, that means that whenever I uh, register my stub in my testing environment, um, I create these no op methods, sorry, these no ops, um, and I'm able to sort of artificially trigger certain event callbacks. So, so you know, one tricky part is Mapbox GL is event driven. Um, I have to make sure that my stub can handle that. Um, so in my tests, I can artificially trigger things like mouse move, and I can say here's here's the callback signature. Um, so that said, uh, real talk. <laughs> Where's Katie? <laughs> um, don't mock what you don't own. This is something that I do, I'm doing in, in, our, in the test suite. Um, in the absence of um, any tests, though, it's, I think, better. Um, and it's working really well for us. But in general, um, you know, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to improve on that and follow, follow this advice. But also, like, we have to have a test suite for this thing. So um, anyways, no more regressions thus far. Um, and anyways, so with all that said, um, with great power, it was really cool maps, I think. Um, how to lie with maps. Um, so like I was saying, maps are direct representations of reality. Um, they're very powerful rhetorical tools. Um, you know, this is a map of Earth. Um, no. Uh, so Maps can be used easily as a tool of deliberate falsification, so sort of propaganda. Um, you may have heard a recent presidential election. Um, I don't read the news though, so I don't know. But anyways, um, yeah, if you look on the left, on, on the left here, um, you can see uh, it looks like, you know, just a huge swarm of people voted one way, but if you actually look at the population distribution of how these votes went, um, it tells a different story. It's a little more even. Um, this is a, PG-13 rated XK, I don't remember what, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the letters are. Yeah, XKCD, thank you. Um, all right, yeah, so uh, this phenomena of, you know, mapping things like all the McDonald's mapped, they're usually just functions of population, uh, where the population's located. Um, so it's easy to sort of start mapping things that you don't really need to. Um, this is a great example. Uh, Twitter data mapped every geotagged tweet sent during the Australian election campaign. Um, it's a function of population density. Um, so, um, also another thing, I, th I thought this was kind of interesting, the way that you can, you know, use map design to sort of change your message to really add severity to your message. On the left here, we have more bins. Um, we use some subtle language changes, violent deaths, a raging epidemic. We have a crosshair over the map. Um, <laughs> lots of little things that you can do to really sort of change your message. So it's, very, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful uh, tool, but um, do so with care. Uh, use it wisely. So um, thank you.